Okay, class. Uh, good day. So, for our meeting today, we're going to tackle your lesson 7, the cerebrospinal fluid. So, we're going to start now, class, with the other body fluids present in our body. We're done with the urine. So, let's start with your cerebrospinal fluid. Now, what is your cerebrospinal fluid, class? Your CSF, class, please take note, is a major fluid of the body produced by the brain. Now, CSF is done, class, in... CSF examination is done, class, in cases of suspicion of diseases like encephalitis, multiple sclerosis, meningitis, neurosyphilis, and intracranial hemorrhage. Now, analysis of, of this fluid class is usually done to patients with unexplained seizure, constantly, consistently increasing fever, dementia, confusion, and poor kinetic skills. Now, CSF class was first recognized by Kotugno in 1764. Now, what are the functions of your CSF? Now, CSF class is important in supplying nutrients to the nervous tissue. It's able to remove metabolic waste, and it is a mechanical barrier to cushion the brain and the spinal cord against trauma. So it's remember, class, uh, CSF is a mechanical barrier that would soften the impact of any blunt trauma or any type of trauma to the brain and to the spinal cord. Now, take note of the CSF formation and physiology. Now, remember this class, CSF is produced in the choroid plexus found in the two lumbar ventricles and in the third and fourth ventricle. So again, class, please take note that CSF is produced in the choroid plexus of the two lumbar ventricles and the third and fourth ventricles. Now, about 70% of CSF is produced in the two lumbar ventricles. So 70% class would be from the two lumbar ventricles, while the remaining 30% would be from the third and fourth ventricles. Now, the choroid plexus class refers to a capillary network that would form the CSF from plasma by mechanisms of selective filtration. So again, class, your CSF class would come from the plasma. What, what happens is that the choroid plexus, itong choroid plexus na to class, this is a capillary network. So ang gagawin niya, if you filter niya palalo yung plasma mo to become this very clean cerebrospinal fluid. Now, hydrostatic pressure and active transport selection will only select minute chemicals to enter the capillary walls. Kaya nga yung, yung CSF nyo class is a very sterile and a very clean body fluid. The reason class is because of these two, hydrostatic pressure and active transport. Very small amounts of chemicals are able to enter the choroid. Plexus. Now take note, class, that the lining, lining the capillaries of the chloride plexus are endothelial cell. So kung ito yung capillaries ng ng chloride plexus nyo, yung lining niya, etong mga to, etong mga cells na nasa lining ng capillary wall niya. These are known as your endothelial cells. Now these cells, class, are arranged in a very tight fitting setup that prevents entry of many molecules. So they are very clustered class. They are very clustered or attached to one another. This attachment or this formation or this clustering basically prevents the entry of many molecules. Now this tight juncture in the choroid plexus is collectively termed as the blood-brain barrier. So this clustered endothelial cells class are known as your blood-brain barrier, also known as your B B. B. Because of that clustered endothelial cells that made up the blood-brain barrier, a lot of molecules are unable to enter. Now, take note, class, that approximately 20 ml of CSF is produced every hour. The fluid would flow through the subarachnoid layer. This is found between the arachnoid and the pia matter. Now, take note, class, that the brain and the spinal cord are lined by the meninges, which would consist of three layers. So, your brain and spinal cord, class, are lined by meninges. Itong meninges nyo na to, 
this Meninja's class would have three layers. Now, the first layer is known as your Dura Matter. Dura Matter class is also known as your Hard... Sorry. Hard Matter. Now, this Hard Matter class is the outer layer. It would line the skull and the vertebral canal. While the second layer, the Arachnoid Matter, this is a spider web like layer. This is the inner membrane. Then we have your Pia Matter or the Gentle... Sorry, uh, this is the gentle matter, the pia matter or the gentle matter. This is the layer lining the brain and the spinal cord. Now, to maintain a volume of 900 to 90 to 150 ml in adults and 10 to 60 ml in neonates, excess CSF class is absorbed back into the arachnoid villi. This would prevent reflux of the fluid. So the volume of your CSF class in adults would be around 90 to 150 ml. While for neonates, it would be 10 to 60 ml. Now, what is the blood-brain barrier class or what is its importance? Now, it would basically control, restrict, or filter blood components. It restricts the entry of large molecules, antibodies, and even Medi medication. Therefore, class CSF con con composition is very different or is very unlike blood. CSF is not an ultrafiltrate of plasma. Diseases like menin meningitis and multiple sclerosis causes, causes the disruption of your BBB. Now, what are the reasons for your CSF analysis? Now, as medical technologies class, we are the ones responsible for analyzing your CSF. Now, these are the things that we would look for. We would detect the bacterial presence, detect malignant cells or your cancer cells, detect any abnormality affecting the central nervous system, and would serve as a guide in the diagnosis and prognosis of disease of the CNS. Meningitis, such diseases class would include meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, CNS malignancy, autoimmune disease such as your multiple sclerosis and neurosyphilis. Now, as uh, one before before we could actually analyze CSF class, it needs to be collected and properly handled. Now, there is what we call different CSF punctures. Now, CSF punctures class are usually done by doctors. Now, there are four types of punctures. We have your lumbar puncture, your cisternal puncture, your ventricular puncture, and your lateral cervical puncture. Now, the lumbar puncture class is the most common type of puncture. It is also known as your spinal tap or lumbar tap. While the cisternal puncture is known as your cisterna magna or the suboccipital sub puncture. Now, let's discuss them one by one. Let's start with your lumbar puncture. Now, lumbar puncture class is the procedure for collection of CSF. It is known as your lumbar tap. So, this is the most common. Now, only doctors or physician can collect the CSF. So, the physician class would first palpate the spinal cord of the patient. Now, using a syringe, the intervertebral space between the L3 and L4 of the spinal column is punctured. So, hahanapin ng doctor, the physician would look for the L3 and L4 vertebrae. And between this, between the L3 and the L4 class, doon siya tutusok. The doctor, the physician will make a puncture between the space or the space between the L3 and the F L4. Now, sometimes, class, in, in depending on the size of the patient, depending on the height of the patient, uh, L4 and L5, position L4 and L5 could be used. So the space between the L4 and L5 could also be used. So this is a very delicate procedure, class, if, if the doctor is not does not have proper practice in performing lumbar tap. This can actually cause paralysis and even severe pain. So the doctor needs to be very knowledgeable in doing this type of procedure because uh, a very terrible effect is paralysis. 
Now, contraindications for this procedure class is when there is an infection or inflammation. When you say contraindication, it means class that you're not able to do this procedure. So you're not allowed to do this procedure if there is an infection or inflammation at the puncture site. So let's say class nakakita, let's say the patient is suffering from a boil or a skin disease. A skin disease at at the area between his L3 and L4. You cannot do lumbar tap. Now, uh, using such an area can induce meningitis, which is actually true, class. Imagine if you act, if you puncture an infected area, the, the organisms, the bacteria could actually enter your, your uh, spinal cord. Now, uh, you, the doctor would usually collect around 8 to 20 ml of CSF. Now, there are two sources, class. According to Strasinger, it would be 8 to 10 ml. According to other books and references, it would be 10 to 20 ml. So let's just stick with uh, 8 to 20 ml of the CSF. Now, when collecting CSF class, three tubes are collected in order. Each tube class would be filled with 2 to 7 ml of CSF. Now, when performing lumbar tap, the doctor will ask the patient to assume a fetal position. Now, if you take a look at the picture, ito yung fetal position niya, class. The legs would be tightly closed, would be tightly closed to the body, and basically, it would assume a fetal position, para siyang fetus, class. So, this is the ideal position of the patient while the physician collects the CSF. Now, class, this is an aseptic technique. When you say aseptic technique, it needs to be properly cleaned. What the physician would normally do at the site of puncture is that it would clean it with alcohol. After cleaning it with alcohol, the physician would clean it with iodine or betadine. Then after cleaning with iodine or betadine in some cases, it would also again be cleaned by alcohol. So this is done, class, to prevent bacteremia. When you say bacteremia, this is introducing bacteria to your blood. So this is an aseptic technique wherein the doctor would clean the site with alcohol, followed by betadine, and in some cases, there would be a third cleaning, followed by, again, alcohol. Now, up to 20 ml of CSF class can be collected and when they are placed in three sterile tubes, which are labeled 1, 2, and 3. So as mentioned earlier, the doctor would collect three tubes. You would label them 1, 2, and 3 in the order in which they are withdrawn. Now, they would be collected class like an evacuated blood system or your blood si or your closed system, yung evacuated tube system. Nyo. Now, always consider stat basis. So this should be done as soon as possible, class. Especially tubes 2 and 3 and tests for glucose. So for tubes 2 and 3, class, the testing, the testing or the processing should be done as soon as possible. Stat dapat sila. And if there is a test for CSF glucose, CSF glucose, it should be done immediately. Now, blood glucose is collected in conjunction with CSF glucose. So if there is a doctor request class for CSF glucose, the med tech should also check the patient's blood glucose. CSF glucose is collected two hours after collection of blood glucose. So if you perform blood glucose collection at 6 a.m., CSF glucose should be done by 8 a.m. Now, let's talk about the three tubes that would be collected. So, tube 1 class, please remember this, is used for chemical and serological testing. So, tube 1 class, please remember, must always be kept frozen to preserve its integrity. It contains the most amount of blood cells, least affected by blood and bacteria from skin contamination during the spinal tap. So, tube 1 class is for your chemistry, and serology. For tube 2 naman class, this is done for microbiological studies. To simplify, tube 2 is for microbiology testing or bacteriology testing. Tube 2 class, please take note, must remain at room temp. 
Then we have your tube tree, which is for microscopic or cell count. Now, when we talk about cell count, we're talking about here hematology. So tube tree class is for hematology. Tube tree must be refrigerated 2 to 8 degrees centigrade to prevent cell lysis. Contains the least amount of cells from a spinal tap. In situations class where in a tube 4 is collected, it must be used for microbiology to exclude skin contamination. It can also be added, used for additional tests. So tube 4 class is done if there is an additional test. Let's say there's a request for histopathology or other uh, different tests. So you could use tube number 4. Now, if only one tube is collected, class, this must be sent to the microbiology section. Let's say, class, that the doctor had a difficulty in collecting CSM and was only able to collect 7 ml of CSM. So this, is only this can only be used for one tube. So what must be done, class, is that the first tube or the only tube must be first processed in the microbiome. Followed by wherein it would be centrifuge and the supernatant can be used for chemistry and serology department. So again, class, if only one tube or there is a limited amount of CSF sample, microbiology section should be the one to test. Followed by chemistry and serology using the supernatant. Now we have the second puncture class. We have the cisternal puncture. Now cisternal puncture class is done by in inserting a needle between the occipital bone. Sa batok mo class. So this is a very difficult procedure and a more more. Uh, this is a more hazard, not technically hazardous, but more prone to risk of paralysis. So patients are more prone to risk of paralysis. So imagine performing a lumbar tap or a cisternal puncture at this location class. Uh, even, even patients would be bothered by that. Then we have your ventricular puncture. Now, this type of puncture class is done by inserting a needle in the ventricles of our brain or the fluid-filled spaces. So, dito class, the, the doctor would use a shunt. When you say shunt, para siyang tube. This is a type of tube where the CSF would flow. So, papasok, ipapasok niya. The tube would enter class using a needle. So, using a needle class, the, the tube would enter into the ventricles. So, papasok siya. Then, after that class, uh, the, the doctor would collect the CSF. So, this is done only class for neonates or newborns. Since, remember class, uh, neonates or newborns have a very soft, yung fontanelles nila are still open. And it would be easy for the physician to collect the specimen. So that's your ventricular puncture. Recommended only for neonates or newborns. You would insert a needle into the ventricles of the brain and you would be able to collect CSF. Then we have your cervical lateral puncture. So this is a rarely performed class. Perform 90 degree angle of the body of the patient. So, ako class personally, I'm, I'm very terrified of this type of procedure. This is usually done between the C1 and C2, malapit sa brain stem nyo. So, this can even, this is a higher risk of causing paralysis. So, mas gusto ko na lang mag lumbar tap or mag lumbar puncture than doing the cisternal and other uh, punctures. Now, let's continue with the physical analysis of CSF. So, initial appearance of normal CSF class is crystal clear. Because remember, the blood-brain barrier is a very tight, uh, tight filter. It does not allow substances to easily pass through. So, most of the time, your CSF normally would appear crystal clear. Now, varying colors and transparency would provide diagnostic information. So the terminology used to describe normal CSF class is crystal clear or colorless. Other terms used class to describe CSF would include turbid, cloudy or milky, bloody, and santochrome. 
So let's discuss them one by one. So first one, if your CSF class would appear hazy, turbid, cloudy, or milky, it means that there is a presence of microorganism seen in meningitis. When you say meningitis, this is the inflammation inflammation of your meninges. To simplify class, uh, your meninges are infected with an organism, microorganism. So this would cause destruction of the blood-brain barrier signified by the presence of protein. Now, a characteristic of having a hazy, turbid, cloudy, milky CSF is that the WBC count of the CSF is over 200 per UL. Then the RBC count is over 400 per UL. Increased amounts of, of protein in CSF class. Please take note of this. If there is an increased amount of protein in CSF, it indicates a disorder that would affect the blood-brain barrier or production of increased amounts of antibodies in the CNS. Presence of WBCs or microorganism obviously indicates infection of the meninges. Then we have your santochromic CSF. Now, whenever we would hear the word santochromic, this refers to the CSF supernatant that is color pink, orange, or yellow. So if you encounter a CSF that is pink, orange, or yellow, si P-O-Y, si P-O-Y, it means that your CSF is santochromic. So if you encounter a orange CSF, it's known as a santochromic CSF. Now, the, the, a santochromic CSF class indicates the presence of RBC degradation product. So, ano ba tong mga degradation product? Nito? What are these degradation product? If your CSF is pink in color, the degradation product is oxyhemoglobin. If your CSF appears color yellow, it means that oxyhemoglobin is converted to unconjugated bilirubin. And unconjugated bilirubin is also known as your B1. Then if it's orange, there's the presence of heavy hemolysis in your CSF. So those are the different degradation products and their characteristic color. Now other causes of santochromic CSF would include elevated serum bilirubin, increased consumption of food with carotene pigment, melanoma pigment, and increased protein concentration. Now, if it's grossly bloody, if your CSF appears grossly bloody class, this is a sign of hemorrhage or traumatic tap. Later class, I will explain the difference between hemorrhage or inter intracranial hemorrhage from traumatic tap. Now, if your CSF is grossly bloody class, the RBC count is over 6,000 per UL. Indicates the presence of RBCs in case of intracranial hemorrhage or traumatic tap. Now, if your CSF naman class is oily, it's contaminated with radiogra radiographic contrast media in cases of intravenous pyelogram. Then, if there's the presence of clotted, so if your CSF would be clotted or would have a pellicle, when you say pellicle class, kunwari ito yung tube nyo, this is your tube, in the topmost layer, there would be a solid clump. There would be a solid clump. That's that's your pellicle. Now, the, the meaning of a clotted CSF or a CSF with pellicle is the destruction of the blood-brain barrier, presence of protein. It could also be in the presence of clotting factors seen in tubercular meningitis. Now, take note, class, that clotted CSF is also indicative of traumatic tap, while those with pellicle formation is indicative of tubercular meningitis. So if you want to differentiate, class, uh, if the patient is having traumatic tap from tubercular meningitis, if the CSF is only clotted, if the CSF is only clotted, it means that it's caused by traumatic tap. But, but if there's the presence of pellicle formation, it could indicate that the patient has tubercular meningitis. When you say tubercular meningitis, we're referring here to tuberculosis of the brain. 
may TB ka sa utak, di ba? Tuberculosis would normally affect the lungs. In this case, uh, the meninges are the affected, are the affected one. So that's uh, importance of pellicle formation. Now, pellicle formation class, as mentioned, is evident in patients with tubercular meningitis. It would appear as a faint, thin, lazy, web-like fibrine clot in the spinal fluid. In some cases, it appears as scum in CSF. Yung scum class, when you say scum, if na notice nyo, uh, when, when you try mixing oil, oil with Sprite, if nakakain na kayo dun sa mga fast food, in one, in one fast food class, if, if, the, if the glasses are not properly clean, Kunwari, ito yung Coke nyo or yung Sprite nyo. Manonotice nyo dito sa taas na parang may mga oily layer. So, that's scum. So, your your pellicle formation would appear like that. Nasa taas siya, yung nasa taas siya ng liquid layer. Now, if it is too thin and hard to decipher glass, it is first refrigerated for 24 hours. And in the next day, you would notice or visualize pellicle formation. So if you're unable to identify class, if it's really a pellicle, you need to refrigerate it for 24 hours. Then you would now be, then after 24 hours, you would now be able to better visualize the pellicle formation. So this is the appearance of your CSF. So from left to right class, so we have your normal, we have your santochromic, so this is yellow, diba? Diba pag santochromic, it's P-O-Y, pink, orange, yellow. Then we have your hemolyze, so red siya. And we have here a cloudy CSF. So dapat class, the normal appearance of your CSF is crystal clear or basically clear class. Now let's go to the abnormal color. So if the colors appear as bloody, bloody would be indicative of fresh blood, usually from traumatic tap or intracranial hemorrhage. So traumatic tap, traumatic top class, whenever we would hear it. This refers to the accidental puncturing of a blood vessel. Or it could be the really same hemorrhage. Now, greenish or grayish indicates the presence of pus cells. So, pus cells class are your white blood cells, indicative of severe inflammatory reaction. If your CSF class would appear yellowish discoloration, usually santochromic to pale, it could contain lice, RBC cells. Lice pumotok na or RBCs that are already destroyed and hemoglobin breakdown and degradation products. So how would you differentiate traumatic tap from intracranial hemorrhage? So let's, let's use the different factors. So for the distribution of blood class, if it's traumatic tap, it's uneven. When you say distribution of blood, remember in collecting CSF, you would be collecting one, two, and three. If it's uneven, let's say only tube 1 is bloody, then tube 2 it's clear, tube 3 is clear, it's a sign that it's tra traumatic, tap, uneven distribution of blood. But if choose 1, 2, and 3 are all bloody, even distribution glass, it's a sign of intracranial hemorrhage. If if it's supernatant naman class, traumatic tap, it would be clear and colorless. But if it's intracranial hemorrhage, the supernatant is santochromic. Diba ang supernatant nyo? This is the, when, when, you, when you centrifuge a sample, at the bottom would be the sediment. Then the liquid portion here, itong liquid dito, this is now known as your supernatant. So to simplify class, your supernatant is just purely liquid. No cell contents, no solid contents in it. Then for clot formation, uh, if it's traumatic top, there would be a clot formation. If it's intracranial hemorrhage, no clot formation. Then the presence of erythrophagia, siderophagia, and hemosiderin, it would be absent in traumatic top, but present in intracranial hemorrhage. Then FDPs. FDPs would stand for fibrin degradation degradation product. 
an example of fibrin degradation product class is your D-dimer. So it would be negative for traumatic tap, positive for intracranial hemorrhage. Now let's discuss it in a more uh, broader sense. So traumatic tap class has an even distribution of blood. So in tube 1, tube 2, tube 3. So on the other hand, CSF from intracranial hemorrhage has even distribution of blood in through tubes. Positive for clot formation if traumatic tap, while negative in intracranial hemorrhage. Clotting factors are only found in blood but not in CSF. RBCs will leak to CSF in traumatic tap causing clot. So, the ba class ang traumatic tap nyo is usually caused by an accidental puncture to a vein or an artery. So, if if it's a uh, if it's a traumatic tap, you were the doctor accidentally punctured the vein, there would be clot formation. The reason class again is because your clotting factors are found in blood but not in CSF. Now, once grossly bloody CSF is left standing at room temp, supernatant would be clear in traumatic tap. RBCs would settle at the bottom of the tube, while santochromic in intracranial hemorrhage with a tinge of yellow, pink, or red. Then D-dimer and erythrophages are only found in intracranial hemorrhage, while negative in traumatic tap. Macrophage in CNS class. So macrophage is a type of WBC. So if you find uh, macrophages in CNS, it's it, they, they basically remove foreign objects and cellular debris like RBCs. It would take two to four hours for macrophages to engulf RBCs in the central nervous system. That's why the, the presence of these cells are only found in entro, intracranial hemorrhage or bleeding in CSS. CNS. So if you were able to find a macrophages class, it's, uh, it's, it means that it's an intracranial hemorrhage. If the CSF is bloody due to traumatic top, there is no macrophage because it would take two to four hours before they engulf foreign substances. Kasi di ba ang traumatic top nyo class, it would occur suddenly. Ang intracranial hemorrhage, matagal na siyang nangyayari. So the CSF was already, uh, the macrophages were already able to engulf foreign substances. Now, presence of both erythrophage and siderophage would mean intracranial hemorrhage. So do memorize this difference class. They will definitely come out in your quiz. Now, CSF volume class. So, the, the usual volume is usually 1 cc. 1 cc class is 1 ml. So, in our body, if you let's say you're weighing around 360 pounds, you would have around 360 ml of, uh, 360 ml of CSF. Now, adults would usually produce 90 to 150 ml every day. Children would produce 10 to 60 ml every hour. 20 ml of CSF produced by choroid plexus. Now, CSF volume would be increased in the following uh, diseases. Acute and chronic congestion of the meninges and acute and chronic infection. Decrease in circulatory collapse, severe dehydration, leakages of CSF, and complete spinal subarachnoid block. Then let's talk about the pH, specific gravity, and pressure of your CSF. So the pH, the normal pH of your CSF is usually at an alkaline pH, 7.30 to 7.45. Diba pag less than 7, acidic. If it's greater than 7, it would be alkaline. So the normal pH class is 7.30 to 7.45. Well, the specific gravity naman class, CSF specific gravity would be around 1.006 to 1.008. Pressure, so CSF pressure would be in, in a horizontal position. It would vary between 70 to 200 millimeters. So if your patient, you collected uh, CSF in a horizontal position, or if you are in a horizontal position class, the CSF pressure would be 70 to 200 millimeter of water, or 0 to, 0 to 8 millimeter of mercury, with the average of 100 to 150 millimeter. 
this is usually measured using a manometer while in a horizontal position. So increase and decrease pressure class would occur in the following. So you would have increased pressure in congestive heart failure, obstruction of the superior vena cava, straining, breath holding pressure against the abdomen. Then you would have decreased pressure in circulatory collapse. Now take note class, this is the summary of the clinical significance of your CSF appearance. So I won't discuss them class because they're basically what I mentioned earlier, but do memorize them, they will come out in your quiz. Now let's go to the microscopic examination of CSF. Now the microscopic examination of CSF is done in your hematology. So what you would be doing here class is cell count. So in cell count, you would be performing WBC and RBC count. Now, the most routine test performed is the WBC count. Now, normal adult CSF class would normally contain, please take note of this, 0 to 5 WBCs per UL and slightly higher in children. However, class in newborns, as many as 30 mononuclear cells per UL is considered normal mononuclear cells class are your macrophages or your monocytes so you would able be able to find as many as 30 macrophages or monocytes so for the adult class it would be 0 to 5 mononuclear per microliter or per ul the newborn up to 30 mononuclear per ul for children's 1 to 4, up to 20 mononuclear per UL. And for children 5 plus, up to 10 mononuclear per UL. Now, lysis of RBCs must be obtained prior to performing WBC count. So when you do WBC count class, you need to destroy other cells, such as your RBC. To do this, you would be using 3% glacial acetic acid. 3% glacial acetic, acetic acid would lyse red blood cell then after that you would use methylene blue methylene blue staining will improve the visibility of the cell now you would be using what you would be using class in in the examination or in cell counting for csf is the standard new bauer counting chamber or your hemocytometer now cells will be counted in the four large corner squares and a large center square on each side of the counting chamber. Yung counting the chamber in your class, they would appear like this. Now, sa gitna niyan, there are two sides. So, you would view them, you would view them on both sides. So, dito. Then, after analyzing this or after examining this first area, you would now go to the next slide. Now, when you view this under the microscope class, it would look like this. It would have large, medium, and small squares. Now, please remember this class. Your new Bauer or your hemocytometer has nine large squares. Ano ba yung nine large squares na yan? These are the large nine squares. Itong red na to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8 and 9. Now, what you would be counting, class, what you would be counting are the four large corner squares. When you say four large corner squares for WBC count is ito. 1, 3, 7, and 9. Now, for every, please remember this, for every large square, for every large corner, corner class, ha? when I say corner, yung upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, there would be 16 medium squares. So, ano ba yung, saan ba yung 16 medium squares na sinasabi mo, sir? If you take a look, class, ito yung 16 medium squares. Nyo. 1, 2, 
3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. For a total of 16 medium squares. Kaya pag tinanong kayo sa quiz nyo, if asked in your quiz, how many, how many medium squares, how many medium squares are found in four large squares? Ulitin yung question class. How many medium squares are found in four large squares? You just multiply it by 4 times 16. So 16, 32. There would be 64 medium squares. So you would be analyzing a total of 64 medium squares for your WBC count. Okay, if you take a look at the ones here at the bottom, this is your WBC, 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 and WBC. Now, if you're going to perform an RBC count class, for RBC count class, you're just going to focus on the, for RBC, you're just going to focus on the center square. So the center square class is also a large a large square naman to. But the difference the difference this time is that it is also made up of 16 16 medium square. So your center square is made up of 16 medium square. So for you to be enlightened, letting go 1 I'm oh, sorry. It's composed of 25 25 medium squares 25 medium squares 1 2 3 4 and 5 5 10 15 20 25 for a total of 25 medium squares now what you would be counting here class is the upper left upper right lower left lower right and the center so ulitin ko class, for the RBC count, you're going to focus on the center square. The center square class has 25, has 25 medium squares. Among the 25 medium squares class, you will just count the five corner, the four corner squares and the center square. So upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, and the center. Now, for every medium square class, for every medium square, for every medium square in the center square, there would be a total of 16, 16 small squares. So if you try to zoom in class, makakita kayo ng 16 na small squares dyan. Okay? So if I ask how many small squares are counted, in your RBC count, it's a total of 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 16 times 5, there would be 80 small squares. So each side of chamber of the hemocytometer or hemocytometer has 9 squares. As shown above, squares 1, 3, 7, and 9 are for WBCs and square 5 is for RBCs. Therefore, a total of 5 squares are used for counting both RBC and WBC. Now, after you're able to count class, one must convert the cells counted into the number of CSF cells per microliter. So this is the formula class. So cells per microliter is equal to the number of cells counted times the dilution factor divided by the number of squares counted times the volume of one large square. So for you to identify this class, first let's tackle the given. Let's start with the volume of your one large square. The volume of one large square class is always equal to the area times depth. So the constant area here is 1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter. So uh, if, if you try to convert this class, uh, the, the area would always be 0 0.1. So, pag tinanong kayo, the volume of one large square is equal to 0 0.1. That is always constant class. Ha? Then, the dilution factor is always the denominator of the dilution ratio when the numerator is 1. So, when you say denomination of the dilution ratio class, let's say you did not dilute. Undiluted siya. 
Kapag undiluted siya class, 1 is to 1 yung ratio. Now, if you try to convert this into fraction, yung first number, the first number here on the left would be the numerator, while the second number would be the denominator. So in this case, class, dilution factor is always the denominator. So if that's in the problem, if it's stated there that the denominator, ang, ang dilution ratio mo, kapag undiluted ka, would be 1. So take a look at this example. Calculate the WBCs per micro, microliter on an undiluted CSF specimen when 80 cells are counted in 4 large squares. So let's apply the formula. So if you take a look, identify first how many cells are counted. So you were able to count 80 cells. So we have 80 here. Then you multiply it by the dilution factor. Again, if it's undiluted class, if it's undiluted, that is a 1 is to 1 ratio. If you convert that into fraction, the first number would be the numerator. The second number would be the denominator. And again, the dilution factor is the denominator. So therefore, your denominator is 1. Dilution factor is 1. So 80 times 1. Then, this, then we continue with the formula. Number of squares counted. So the number of squares counted are 4 large squares class. Always remember, four large, lagging large, it's always the large squares that we would use. Sir, what if naman ang given is medium square? So you just have to convert the medium squares for the WBC. Let's say ang given sa problem nyo, uh, 32 medium squares were counted for WBC. Again, ano yung rule natin for WBC count? One large square has 16 medium squares. So if it's 32 medium squares, that means two large squares were used. Okay, so we have four. Then we multiply it by the volume of one large squares. Again, the volume is a constant 0 0.1. So we have 4, which is the number of squares counted, times 0 0.1. We have 0.4. So 80 divided by 0 0.4 class is equal to 200 cells per UL. Again, do not forget. Do not forget to add the unit. So 80 cell, 200 cells per microliter or per UL. Now what if another problem class? This one. Calculate the WBC's microliter on CSF specimen diluted 1 is to 50 when 150 cells are counted in 3 large squares. So let's first identify the number of cells counted. So you were able to count 150. So here you would be have 150. Then what is the dilution factor? If it's 1 is to 50 in ratio form, you convert this into fraction. So the numerator would be the first number. The denominator would be the second number. And again, kapag dilution factor, your dilution factor is always the denominator. Therefore, your dilution factor is 50. So 150 cells counted times the dilution factor, 50. Then you divide it by the number of squares counted. We have 3. Then the volume of one large square, which is 0.1. So 7,500 divided by 0.3 would be equal to 25,000 cells per UL. Again, do not forget to add the unit. Now, another microscopic examination for CSF class is the CSF differential. When you say CSF differential, you're trying to identify the different cells or the different WBCs. So you would make a blood spear from the sediment and then you would stain it using right stain. Then you need to count or you need to differentiate 100 cells. If the cell count is low, report only the number of cell types seen. 100 cells are for WBCs and they are differentiated from each other. Now, CSF concentration must be done, class. So when you say concentration, you, you, try, to re, you try to separate the sediment from the fluid. And to do this, you could do the following. Sedimentation, filtration, centrifugation and cytocentrifugation. For cytocentrifuge, this is an automated centrifuge, places cells on a filter membrane. This increases the number of cells to evaluate. 
However, risk of cell distortion from the centrifugation process. So to to remove the risk of uh, the distortion, yung masisira yung cell nyo class, what you need to do is that you're going to add one drop of 30% albumin. In some cases, two drops of 20% albumin. So by doing this, you decrease cell distortion. Albumin would preserve cell integrity. Now, normal cells in the CSF are primarily lymphocytes and monocytes class. So, adults have a predominance of lymphocytes to monocytes, 70 to 30 ratio. 70 to 30 ratio. On the other hand, the ratio is reversed in children. So, 70% class are lympho, while 30% are mono. For adults, but if in, in children, reverse siya. When I say reverse, 70% are mono, monocytes, while 30% are lymphocytes. So, take note of that. That's for children. Tandaan nyo lang yung 70-30 ratio for lymphocytes to monocytes. Then, what are the clinical significance of increased cell type? So if you have increased lymphocytes and monocytes, it would be a sign of viral, tubercular, and fungal meningitis, multiple sclerosis, and even HIV or AIDS. Increased nucleated RBC, usually contamination from bone marrow. Increased neutrophils in bacterial meningitis, early cases of viral, tubercular, and fungal meningitis. Cerebral hemorrhage, injection of medication. Increase eosinophil naman class is seen in parasitic or fungal infection. Increase macrophages seen in RBCs in spinal fluid like in repeated lumbar tops. Intracranial hemorrhage. Then we have your lymphoblasts, myeloblasts, monoblasts seen in acute leukemia. Then we have your plasma cells seen in multiple sclerosis. Then if there's too much ependymal cells, choroidal cells, spindle-shaped cells, it could be a diagnostic procedure. Then malignant cells would be a sign of cancer. Now, what are the non-pathologically significant cells? So frequently seen following ventricular taps or during neurosurgery. So you would find choroidal cells. Now, what are these choroidal cells? These are epithelial lining of the choroid plexus. Then we have your ependymal cells. It's the lining, cells found in the linings of ventricles and neural canal. Then we have your spindle-shaped cells lining from the arachnoid. Then you have your cellular inclusions. So what are these cellular inclusions class? These are macrophages that are present to clear cellular debris and foreign objects such as red blood cells. They appear again within two to four hours after RBCs enter the CSM. So if it's a erythrophage class, erythrophage is simply a macrophage that has ingested red blood cell. Siderophage naman class are macrophages that have engulfed hematoidin crystals. Now hematoid crystals class are the product are the product of further degradation of hemosiderin granules of red blood cells. Now let's talk about the chemistry of CSF. So we're done with your hematology. Now let's go to CSF. So the following chemicals are tested for chemistry class. Proteins, glucose, lactate, glutamine, and enzymes. Let's start first with your CSF protein. So CSF protein class is the most frequently chemist, frequent, uh, frequently performed chemistry, chemistry test on CSF. Now normal CSF would contain very minute amounts of protein usually around 15 to 45 milligram per DL. Higher values are expected in adults, ranging age 40 and above, and in neonates. So if you're 40 years old and above class, you would have higher CSF, CSF proteins and even neonates. Now, the major CSF proteins in order class are the following. We have your albumin. It makes up the majority of the CSF protein. Then we have your prealbumin, also known as your transthyretin, your alpha globulins, known as your haptoglobin and ceruloplasmin, beta globulin, known as your transferrin, gamma globulin, known as your IgG and IgA. Gamma globulins class are also known as your immuno, 
globulins or commonly known as antibodies, which could be uh, an example of antibodies is IgG and IgA. Then we have your tau transferrin. Now, tau transferrin is the only protein seen in CSF not found in plasma. So itong albumin, prealbumin, alpha globulin, beta globulin, and gamma globulins, they could be seen in plasma class. It is only your tau transferrin that is not seen in plasma. They are only seen in CSF. Because it's only seen in CSF class, it is used as a basis when in doubt if the fluid is indeed CSF. Then another type of protein is your myelin basic protein. Now, myelin basic protein is indicative of recent destruction of the myelin sheet. Diba yung myelin sheet nyo? It covers your neurons. It is specific to, pro to patients with multiple sclerosis. So if your patient is positive for MBP, it means that the myelin sheet are destroyed by multiple, seen in multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, kasi class, your antibodies, your own antibodies are attacking your myelin sheet. And an effect of that is that it would there would be myelin basic proteins. Now, CSF proteins class are elevated in meningitis, specifically fungal and bacterial. Hemorrhage, CNS tumor, multiple sclerosis, guillain barr syndrome, neurosyphilis, polyneuritis, mycedema, Cushing syndrome, connective tissue disease, diabetes, uremia, and traumatic top. Decrease in water intoxication, CSF leakage, and recent puncture. Now, how would you measure CSF protein? So you would do the following methods, or you could do the following methods. We have the first one, the turbidimetric method. It employs the precipitation of proteins class using strong acids such as your trichloroacetic acid and sulfosalicylic salicylic acid. So turbidity production class is then subjected to instrumentation in the form of nephelometry. So you would use a nephelometer class to uh, assess the turbidity. Then we have your dye binding. Uses dyes like Kumasi Brilliant Blue or your CBB that turns red to blue when bound to a protein. Other dyes used are Lori Assay and Ponchu S. Now your an unknown method class for proteins is your electrophoresis. Electrophoresis class would separate proteins proteins based on their molecular weight or yung bigat nila. Now, the most common method used for the analysis of specific types of protein essential when diagnosing multiple sclerosis. So, as mentioned, class, if, if, you, un, if you let plasma or CSF undergo electrophoresis, they would separate or the proteins would be separated. So albumin would be the fastest protein to migrate in the electrophoresis. Gamma globulins or immunoglobulins are the slowest to migrate. They usually stay at the point of origin. Then in multiple sclerosis, proteins in the CSF migrate to the gamma region. So ito yung gamma region, class. They would migrate to this region. And these proteins are termed as oligoclonal bands, which are made up of immunoglobulins. Presence of two or more oligoclonal bands in CSF, but not in serum, is diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. So let's say, class, yung serum nyo, in-undergrow nyo ng electrophoresis. So ito yung gamma region. In the gamma region in your serum, only one, uh, only one band is found. But when you undergo CSF, when you undergo CSF in electrophoresis, you were able to find two bands, two bands in the gamma region. It means class that the patient has MS or multiple sclerosis. So other conditions that would cause increase. Uh, MS bands or increased IgG would include neurosyphilis, cryptococcal meningitis, 
bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis, panencephalitis, and Guillain-Barr syndrome. Now, uh, it's very important, class, that you would be able to identify the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. So you would be, be doing two tests. So you would do a CSF serum albumin index and a CSF IgG index. So if, if the if the index value of the CSF serum albumin index is less than 9, the blood-brain barrier is intact, meaning no increased permeability. But if the index value, the CSF serum albumin index is greater than 9, there is a problem with your BBB or there's a leakage with your BBB. Now, another test, please remember the formula class. Huh? CSF albumin, CSF serum albumin index is equal to CSF albumin in milligram per DL divided by serum albumin in grams per DL. Now, another test, yung CSF IgG index nyo. So, normal value for CSF IgG index is less than 0.7. Increased CSF IgG, uh, increased plasma cells within CSF, disruption of the BBB that allows entry of CNS. So if you have increased CSF IgG class, katulad ng mga conditions na to, may neurosyphilis ka, may cryptococcal meningitis ka, and others, it's a sign that there is increased plasma cells sa CSF mo, and your BBB is uh, disrupted. So the formula for CSF IgG index is... CSF IgG divided by serum IgG over CSF albumin divided by serum albumin. Let's go to the second chemical class, yung CSF glucose. So the reference value for CSF glucose is 60 to 70% of plasma glucose. Kaya nga class, is very important that you would be doing or you would, you would have to collect plasma glucose first, then CSF glucose. It means that a corresponding plasma glucose determination must be done in conjunction with CSF. So if you have a plasma glucose of 100 mg per DL, the ideal CSF level must be around 65 mg per DL. So saan nang galing yung 60, 65? If you take a look, class, yung CSF glucose, you should be 60 to 70%. So if you try to average that, 60 plus 70 is equal to 130 divided by 2, you get 65. So the average or the ideal CSF if your plasma glucose is, uh, the ideal uh, CSF glucose if your plasma glucose is 100 mg per DL should be 65 mg per DL. Blood glucose should be drawn two hours prior to lumbar tap. So, mauuna mo na yung blood glucose class, then you wait two hours. So, elevated blood glucose would be seen in elevation in plasma level. So, kung mataas yung blood glucose mo, mataas din yung CSF glucose mo, seen in diabetes mellitus. And if your CSF is contaminated with blood. Now, glucose would be decreased in the following, bacterial and fungal infection because it would utilize glucose as energy. Tubercular meningitis, hypoglycemia, brain tumor, leukemia, and damage to CNS. Then we have the other chemicals class. So we have your glutamine, CSF glutamine. It's produced from ammonia and alpha-ketoglutarate by, by the brain cells. Normal CSF glutamine is 8 to 18 mg per DL. Upon reaching 35 mg per DL, this could lead to a loss of consciousness. May himatay ka, class, magiging unconscious ka. Elevated levels of glutamine is seen in coma of unknown origin. So kung na-comatose ka, class, Ray syndrome, liver disorders, increased levels are associated with increase in ammonia, which is toxic to the body. Then we have your CSF lactate. Now, lactate class, CSF lactate, is essential in diagnosing meningitis cases. A physician could differentiate the cause of meningitis using CSF lactate level. So the normal level of your lactate, CSF lactate, is 11 to 22 mg per DL. Increase in hypoxia, head injury, hemorrhage, or hemorrhage, cerebral infarction, and meningitis. 
So if your lactate level class is greater than 35 mg per dl, it's bacterial meningitis. If it's greater than 25 mg per dl, it's tubercular and fungal meningitis. If less than 25 mg per dl, it's viral meningitis. Then we have your enzymes class. So in, in cases of an infection, inflammation, or damage, certain enzymes would be elevated. So the first one would be your lactate dehydrogenase or your LDH, specifically LD1 and LD2 in brain tissue. So we have your brain injury, CNS leukemia, lymphoma, metastatic carcinoma, and bacterial meningitis. So if you have any of this class, you would have increased LDH in your CSM. Then we have your creatinine kinase, specifically CK1, also known as your CKBB. So if the patient has hydrocephalus, cerebral infarction, brain tumor, subarachnoid hemorrhage, head trauma, they would have an increased CK1 or CKBB. Then the enzyme adenosine deaminase, which is increased in tubercular meningitis and mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now let's go to your microbiology test for CSM. So the role of microbiology laboratory class is determine the causative agent of meningitis. So growth of microorganism is 24 hours in case of bacterial meningitis to six weeks for tubercular meningitis. CSF culture class is a confirmatory procedure. So there are different types of meningitis. Now, for you to identify them, class, these are their characteristics. So if you have bacterial meningitis, you would have an elevated WBC count. Neutrophils are the most predominant. Diba? Lymphocyte and monocyte ang madami. Lymphocyte specifically for adults and for neonates, it's monocytes. But in cases na mayroong kang bacterial meningitis, neutrophils are the ones that's predominant. Marked protein elevation. Markedly decreased glucose levels, lactate greater than 35 mg per dl, positive gram stain, and bacterial culture. For gram negative bacteria, positive for limulus lysate test. Then, if you have tubercular meningitis, you would have elevated WBC count. Lymphocytes and monocytes are predominant. Moderate to mark protein elevation. Decreased glucose levels, lactate greater than 25 mg per dl, and a pellicle formation. Then we have your viral meningitis, elevated WBC count, lymphocytes are predominant. Moderate protein elevation, normal glucose levels, normal lactate levels. Then we have your fungal meningitis, elevated WBC count, lymphocytes and monocytes are predominant. Moderate to mark increase mark protein elevation. Decreased glucose levels, lactate greater than 25 mg per dl, positive India ink with cryptococcus neoformans, positive immunologic test for cryptococcus neoformans. Then the major causes of bacterial meningitis, so we have your group B streptococcus, your S agalactiae, Streptococcus agalacti, A-G-A-L-A-C-T-I-A-E, is also known as your group B streptococcus. It would be the cause of bacterial meningitis in neonates. Then Escherichia coli, newborn to one month. Haemophilus influenzae, one to five years old. Neisseria meningitidis, five to 29 years old. Streptococcus pneumoniae, above 29 years old. And Listeria monocytogenes, in immunocompromised individuals. So do memorize the major lab results class. Ito rin yung minention ko. Do memorize them. Do memorize this table. Lalabas yan sa quiz nyo. Then also memorize this table class. Yun lang din siya. Uh, may, may kasama lang na WBC in a simpler form. So do memorize this. Summary of CSF lab test class for meningitis. So for WBC, for WBC class, ha, kapag may bacterial meningitis ka, predominant is neutrophil. 
for viral tubercular and fungal meningitis, predominant lymphocytes and monocytes. For protein, bacterial meningitis, markedly elevated. For viral meningitis, proteins are moderately elevated. For glucose, bacterial and tubercular meningitis, you would have low glucose class. For fungal meningitis, normal to decrease glucose. For other tests, for bacterial meningitis, positive for both gram stain and bacterial antigen tests. For tubercular meningitis, pellicle formation and elevated adenosine deaminase. Then for fungal meningitis, positive for inja ink stain and serologic tests with cryptococcus neoformans. So that ends the CSF class. Thank you.